Good morning. Welcome to Friday. Hopefully you've made it through this week um, in fairly good shape. Be and are grateful, you know, that we're here and now able to complete our week and spend some good quality time this weekend with family. So I would like to welcome you to our webinar this morning. I'm Victoria Beal with the Ohio LTAP Center. And the webinar that you're participating in today is called How to Avoid Death by PowerPoint. Before we get things started, there's just a couple of housekeeping items I want to go over with you. And I know we still have people joining the webinar, so I may repeat these housekeeping items a couple minutes into the webinar as well. But we have for you today in the handout section of the GoToWebinar box, um, a handout that you're welcome to download anytime during the presentation. It's a, an outline of what I'll be discussing, and it's something that I'm gonna touch on during the presentation. So even if you don't download it right now, you know, when you get towards the end of the presentation time, you might wanna just download it. So you'll have it available. Um, the other thing is that I'm going to be trying some polls today. So hopefully this works well. I've not used myself the, the polling feature in GoToWebinar until yesterday, um, and it went pretty well on the one that we did it on. So I'm gonna be starting the first poll here in a minute. Um, the other thing is I am attempting to record the webinar. So please don't let that dampen your enthusiasm though for asking questions. And I'm happy to take whatever questions you have in the question pod. Um, I will try to respond to those as quick as I can, but I'm doing double duty this morning. New, normally I'm just the, the host for the webinars, but I'm actually your presenter today too. So I'll get to your questions as soon as I possibly can. So with that, the other thing I wanna mention is that as many of you are, I am telecommuting from home. So I have made my rounds and let everybody in my house know that I was gonna be doing this webinar today at 10 and ask them all to please you know, keep the noise level down. But if you hear the occasional dog bark, please understand that I too am telecommuting as many of you are due to the COVID-19 outbreak. So um, it's, you know, we're still working and we're still getting things accomplished that we need to, but forgive me if you do hear the dog bark in the background. Um, hopefully they're pretty happy right now. I loaded them up on some treats before we got started this morning, so. Um, for those of you who just joined the last few seconds, please note that there is a, a handout in the handout section of the GoToWebinar box, um, and you're welcome to um, download that at any time during the, hand, the time. Um, oh, I've got someone saying that they can't hear anything, so let me respond to them real quickly. Um, let's see, I'm gonna let them know to please call in to the webinar if their computer audio isn't working. Okay. Oh, other people said they can hear me fine, so that's good. Um, all right, so we're gonna go ahead and get things rolling then. Again, I'm Victoria Beal with the Ohio LTAP Center and welcome to How to Avoid Death by PowerPoint. Um, Let's see, we did have another question that came in. Where is the go-to section of the webinar? There's a panel, like a little go-to webinar panel box that opens up on the screen normally. Um, and if you're not finding that handout section in there, I am more than happy to also email it out to everybody um, once the webinar is completed. So don't stress over it if you, you don't get the handout downloaded. Um, but for the person asked me the question, it's probably above or below where you went to ask me the question at, so. Okay, and someone else mentioned that you might wanna use the orange arrow, arrow if the box isn't open, so there we go. All right, how to avoid death by PowerPoint. Um, the reason I've put this presentation together is that there are so many times I go to a conference or you know a meeting and people are utilizing PowerPoint in ways it was never intended to be used. And when they do that, I don't know if they catch it or not, but usually while I'm sitting in the room, if they were to look at me, my face gets the same look on it that the kid on the left side of your screen gets. You know, that look like just 
complete and utter disbelief and really just not at all happy with what I'm seeing because I just know that they're going to kill me with PowerPoint. So, you know, the reason why we're talking about this topic today is that when it comes right down to it, you are the presenter, not the PowerPoint. The PowerPoint is your aid in your presentation, but you know, do not let your PowerPoint take over and be the presentation. You don't want it to distract from what you're talking about. You don't want it to replace what you're doing or be, you know, heaven forbid, the tool that makes them focus on something else while you're talking and distracts them completely from what the, you know, topic should be. Um, there's a lot of times, too, that I see people in the audience, especially as the slides go on and on, they're like, stop, please stop. I can't take any more. Um, and sometimes people even get up and leave. And to me, that is just, you know, the wrong use of PowerPoint. And hopefully, you know, to anyone who I might have had in a presentation that I did that to, you know, I, I'm so sorry I ever did it. And I'm trying to learn from my mistakes. And I want to share the tips and tricks that I have found with everyone this morning in the hopes that it'll help you improve your use of PowerPoint with your presentations as well. Um, you know, a lot of times, and I, I mentioned this already, people don't realize that they really are the storyteller. And the PowerPoint is just your tool. Um, when you get assigned a presentation to do, the first thing that you do should not be to, you know, open up PowerPoint and start immediately creating slides. So what I want you to understand is that PowerPoint, you know, a lot of times has been referred to as the, the cockroach of the office because it's just something when it shows up and so many times it's used in the wrong way that it just really distracts people and, you know, makes them completely turn off from being um, engaged in your presentation. So uh, speaking of engagement, I would like to do a quick poll with you now that we are a few minutes into this, it's just so I can get a feel for where everybody is working from today. So I'm launching the poll. Um, let's see, poll must be closed to enable screen sharing. Oh, I've launched the poll and I'm collecting responses. I can't see the, the screen you guys are responding on, but um, you know, please go ahead and answer the poll real quickly. And while you guys are answering the poll, I'm gonna see if there's, um, no, no, no other questions right now, so that's great. Hey, whoever is working from the undisclosed, undisclosed beach location, kudos to you, good for you. Um, I had to put the one about the parking lot of the local library on there because I live in a, a very rural area and I know that there's some neighbors who don't have as good a Wi-Fi as I do and they're actually like driving over to the library and sitting on the parking lot because even though the library's closed, they've left their Wi-Fi service on and you can sit in the parking lot and connect into it if you need to. So, all right, I'm gonna, it looks like we've got 92% of you who have voted. So I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll and share the responses. And I'd say that there's a huge portion of you who are you know, following the, the stay at home order, whether it's here in Ohio or elsewhere, and you're definitely working from home. And again, that one person that figured out how to sneak off to the beach, good for you. So I'm gonna go ahead and hide this poll now and we'll keep going with the presentation. So, you know, discussing PowerPoint as being the tool that aids you and not letting it be the, the cockroach of the presentation. You know, what it comes down to is we do all have to do presentations at times. And a presentation is not, you know, taking a book or writing a book and reading it to people. And a lot of people do have a tendency to want to basically author a, a book and then feel like they have to give all the, the exact technical, you know, wording on the slide to the people who are in their audience. Don't do that to them, please. They can read it just as well as you can after the presentation's finished. Give them 
the high points. Tell them why it is they need to understand this information, but don't put it word for word on your screen. You know, if you were to take the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices or the AASHTO Green Book or any of the more technical publications that we use in transportation and go to the front of the room and as your presentation, just read to them from that. You know, they would immediately shut off. I would guess that probably about half the people in the audience would get up and leave, and the other half would just sit there in disbelief. So why would you want to take those exact words and put them on the PowerPoint screen and then make them sit there in the audience and read it to them? Don't do that to them. You know, what you want to do is be able to explain what you're trying to communicate, but, you know, do it in a way that is engaging and hopefully thought provoking and let them go back and read the actual wording then afterwards. Um, you know, we have to do presentations which are very technical in nature. You know, we have to deliver information to people, you know, and almost always we're trying to teach them something through our presentations. So, you know, what you want to do is be able to take that information and present it in a way that will give them the points they need to take away with them without, you know, killing them with the PowerPoint. And what I'm hoping you'll do today is take the information that you're learning in this webinar and, you know, that outline that I'm going to email out to you later on if you weren't able to download it out of the handout pod and use it to, to dig inside and find that hero that's in you. Because I know that there's a hero inside of all of us who wants to do the very best we can and give the best presentation ever and be the person that people talk about when they leave whichever conference they're leaving and say, you know what, of all the presentations, I like this one the best. I took the most away from it and I feel like I can go back now and apply the information that I've learned. And that's because that person, you know, has really dug deep to be that presentation hero. And I know that all of you can do that. So, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to talk through ways that can make you a presentation hero. And, you know, don't feel like you've got to sit and scribble copious notes during this because I have a handout for you. That's why there's not a lot on the screen because I don't intend to kill you with death by PowerPoint during this presentation. Um, what I intend is that you're going to learn information and then have it to take back and apply it. And don't feel like you got to also go back and immediately apply everything that you're learning this morning because it does take time, you know. You don't change things immediately and overnight. It's a process. So with that, I decided in my presentation and putting it together that I wasn't going to actually use any of the oh, 100 or so slides I'd collected over the last year from different presentations I've been privileged to watch because I didn't want to pick on anyone in particular. And so what I did is I went out and found a slide on the internet that made a lot of the same mistakes I've seen other people make, but this slide, it's anonymous. I don't know who authored it, and I can tell you specifically none of my colleagues authored it. So, you know, what I'm going to do is use this and some other examples to talk to you about um, things that are problems with PowerPoint slides. And the first one, hopefully you're seeing it already, is that people put too much text on a slide. You know, don't put whole sentences on a slide and definitely don't cram so much information in there that if you were in the back of the room, you definitely would never be able to read all of this. I mean, there's 11 bullet points on this slide and the information is just crammed in there. So, you know, sentences are out, guys. Do not put whole sentences on PowerPoint slides. Keywords are in. And, you know, with keywords, you want to just touch on the essence of what it is that you're going to have a conversation about. You know, I have not put word for word what I'm discussing with you on the slides today. I'm having a conversation with you as if you were sitting here with me in my home office and we were having a cup of coffee and talking through, you know, this topic. So make sure that, you know, you put the keywords on the screen. And then you save the conversation you're going to have with your audience for just that, the, the time that you're presenting and actually having the conversation. So going back to that slide, you know, way too much information on there. 
make sure that you look at it from the point of view of no sentences and using keywords. And you can work through this on your outline too. Your outline, really when you get a presentation assigned or you, you know, volunteer to do a presentation, the first thing I do is not open PowerPoint and start working on it. The first thing I do is open up a Word doc and create my outline for my presentation. You know, and once I create the outline, that's when I open up PowerPoint and start looking at how can I build a visual that will aid me in delivering the information that's in my outline. The other thing that I want to talk to you about is that there really can be too many bullet points on a slide. And, you know, even when I was building the presentation that I'm delivering for you this morning, you know, I found that every time I opened up a slide, the bullet points were like automatically there. PowerPoint starts you with a bullet point. I had to turn it off over and over and over again, except for like this slide where I wanted to bring this point home to you. So make sure that you're not overusing bullet points. The other thing is spread your ideas out. You don't need to have everything crammed on one slide. This is not that standard that you might have heard about where it's like one slide per minute. So if I've got 30 minutes for my presentation, I need to have 30 slides and everything's got to fit on the 30 slides. You know, spread your information out and make sure that you are, you know, doing just really one thought or one concept per slide. And it's okay if you have more than 30 slides for 30 minutes because if you're just touching on one concept, your slides are just going to move that much quicker, but you'll keep people engaged. So, you know, talking about one concept and one, you know, thought per slide, say we wanted to take this last bullet point in the very bottom, number 11, and we wanted to look at trying to make that a visual representation of that bullet point. So, you know, I would guess that the people who watched this original presentation where this slide was used never even got to bullet point 11 or probably when it was read to them, they don't remember it. But I would say that if the presenter had taken that and broke it out on a slide and maybe visually represented it because it, it's talking about, you know, putting a decimal point in red ink and that that'll help with visual perception with a dyslexic child when you're teaching math if they'd taken and put a, a number on the screen that had a decimal point in it, and then while they were talking about that concept, actually used PowerPoint to turn the decimal point red, that the people in the audience would remember that, as opposed to it being bullet point number 11 on a very, very crowded slide. So, you know, think about creative ways that you can represent the information that you want to deliver. And if you can't come up with a way, talk to your colleagues, you know, talk to other people in your office, you know, go out and do some research and see what you can come up with just Googling a few terms. Because I would bet you that you can definitely come up with ways to deliver this information that will help them take that information back and remember it. You know, that's the other thing, you know, one idea per slide, make sure you're spreading it out. And you want to make certain that, you know, as you're delivering it, you know, you can follow along on your notes. Um, but, you know, you want to make sure you're not overwhelming them with too much information on one slide. So as I mentioned before, that handout that's in the chat pod, excuse me, the handout pod, it's an outline. It is not what you see on the left hand side of your screen, which is where someone takes PowerPoint and then makes a note page printout of it. It's really truly more of an outline, kind of like what's on the right hand side of the page. And I'm a big believer in delivering information in bite sized chunks. And what I mean bite sized chunks is, you know, give it to them in a format or in enough context that they can understand what they need to, but don't make it part of something that's so much larger and so overwhelming that they feel that they just don't even have time to process it right now. So you'll notice with my handout um, that you'll receive if you don't can't download it out of the handout area that there's three pages and it's an actual outline. I don't have slides on there, um, but you'll notice if you go back and look at the recording, which hopefully will be working, um, you'll see that the outline follows along with what I've created here visually in the slide deck. 
The next thing I want to talk to you about is contrast. Um, and before I do this, let me double check our question pod. Oh dear. Okay, so somebody lost their um, audio, but they got it back, so that's great. I'm glad to hear that. And then somebody would like to have a link to the completed webinar. Yes, we'll be sending that out. Don't you worry about that. So I think that's all I've got in there right now. And then the other thing I want to do is let's take a second and do another quick poll um, because I definitely want to keep you engaged during this webinar. So um, let's go ahead and launch this next poll. And if you wouldn't mind responding to that, it's asking you how many times a year you're asked to do presentations. So it looks like the majority of you are giving presentations a ton throughout the year you know, five or more presentations a year. So I would say to me, that would be a lot of presentations in, you know, any position where you're dealing with a, a lot of technical information. So it does definitely look like that's going to be the, the big response. I'm waiting once we get up over 80% uh, who have voted, I'll go ahead and close the poll out so you guys can see the responses. And my dogs haven't barked once while we've been doing this, so this is a great thing. Okay, I'm going to go ahead, last call for votes. I'm going to close the poll and show you the responses. So we've got 44% of you on this webinar, and, and there's 202 of you on today, as of this moment, um, who are doing five or more presentations per year. So hopefully you'll get some good information. You'll be able to take and work on your presentations and, you know, make them so you're not killing people with death by PowerPoint. And, you know, and for those of you who aren't doing five or more a year, this is still a great opportunity to take the presentations that you do have to provide and be able to work on them to, um, to have a different delivery style. So the next thing I want to talk to you about is contrast. And with contrast, what you want to do is look at what is going to draw the person's eye on the screen. So in preparing this PowerPoint, I was actually able to figure out that PowerPoint has some tools on it that I had not used previously. And, you know, the tools that I was able to use actually helped me with these apples you'll see at the bottom of the screen. I found those apples and I was able to put the picture in PowerPoint and then tell it to get rid of everything that was behind the apples. So that helped me with building that contrast between the apples themselves and the, the white background. Um, but you'll also notice up top when I put the letters in, um, the, you know, I put those in in black to make them stand out a bit more. Now, one thing that is talked about a lot is that the brightest thing on the screen is what draws your eye. So what I decided to do with this slide is actually move it into a black background. And you'll notice when I did that, all of a sudden, the word contrast really, at least for me, jumped out at me. And then the apples really jumped out as well. So, and this is actually a tip or a trick that um, a presenter that who has just been throughout his career was renowned for his presentations used, and that's Steve Jobs. So I would encourage you to take a look at, you know, how can you build contrast into your presentation? With this presentation, what I tried to do was start with the black background. And then when I got to this slide, I did modify it to put that white background in so I could show you guys the, the difference here. Um, but I want to encourage you to take a look at, you know, using different contrast tips or excuse me, tools in PowerPoint and see what you can do to really make things, you know, stand out on your screen. And we're going to talk about a few other um, things that are related to contrast as well. But I wanted to make certain that you are aware that those tools are there in PowerPoint. Be careful, though, and this slide that I'm sharing with you on my screen right now, um, that you don't get too much contrast and contrast that is really awkward. Um, when I say awkward, it hurts my eyes to look at this slide right now. And I did not create this slide. I went out and found it on the internet. Um, color coordination is really important. So make certain when you're building contrast that you don't get colors that conflict with each other or make it more difficult for your 
audience to read the screen because what you want to do is enhance and not detract from your presentation. And if you have issues with, you know, color matching and, and you know, if you do go talk to somebody else in your office. And once you've built the presentation, say, hey, can you go look at this and see if, you know, you feel like the colors are working good or not. Um, you know, the other thing is it's great to pick a, a color scheme or a template and work with it throughout the whole presentation. And this brings me to the point of when I've delivered this presentation before, I've been asked about um, people or organizations who have templates, PowerPoint templates that they have to use with branding on them. You know, I wouldn't try to build my contrast so it conflicts with those templates. I want definitely build my contrast to enhance those templates. And I know, you know, if you've been told you have to use a template, you have to use it. So, you know, there's no getting around that. But I'll tell you, once you get past the first few screens with that template around the outside edge, people are really just going to focus on what you're delivering in the middle. So make sure that you're applying what you're, you know, learning about this morning to that center section that you can control, you know, do what you can with what you have from where you are. And that's all that can really be asked of you. So, you know, make sure that you are looking at using a color scheme, if at all possible, and that'll help to keep your presentation less distracting and more enhancing of what you're trying to deliver. Keep focus on what it is you're talking about. So you want to make sure that you're using your contrast to help people keep their focus on it. And you can leverage your contrast too. You might have noticed on earlier slides when I had words come in, keywords come in, and then more keywords come in that I was moving on to talk about, I grayed out the previous keyword. Here, I'm leveraging the contrast of the red. And then we discussed this in the last slide, but streamline your color scheme. So you'll see on this slide, I used that technique of the color scheme streamlining and brought the red from the last slide onto this one and used it to help leverage contrast and also to help you keep your focus as I was talking about the different topics. Um, so as you're working through your presentation, this series right here of slides, they are actually just three different slides. I did not try to figure out how to move things in and out, animate them in the, the slide deck. I just made three different slides and made the text color different on each of the slides in order. So you can definitely use that as a technique in your presentations. Um, going back to our slide that we're using as a teaching tool, I want to talk to you about font size. You know, font size really does matter in a presentation and whatever you want to be the most important point you're trying to communicate on the screen should be the biggest thing on the screen. In this slide, I would guess that the person who put this together did not mean for the suggestions for teaching math to be the most important thing they were trying to communicate. I would guess that they were trying to say these 11 bullet points down here were the most important thing they were trying to communicate. But they really lost that when they put them smaller sized in font and, you know, grouped them all together as complete sentences on that screen. So make sure that, you know, you're spreading your ideas out slide by slide and that you are making the most important thing that you want to deliver the biggest font on the screen. I have in my research learned that not only does the um, font size matter, but the readability of the font is very important. And you'll find that in that handout that I'm going to email out to everybody afterwards, that um, part of my research said that the sans serif family of fonts really help with readability. So they suggested that you stick with the sans serif family of fonts. They also said to keep it simple stay away from heavily stylized fonts. You don't want to have something that's really complex on the screen because you don't want them to be trying to focus on reading that really scriptive text when you want them to be paying attention to what you're talking about. You know, so put a keyword on the screen, keep the font simple. Also, please don't use random sizes in your font. It's very distracting. This is not a ransom note. 
this is where we're trying to make something um, enhance what it is you're talking about and not detract from it. And I know I've said that a lot, but that's the whole point of, you know, not killing people with death by PowerPoint. Um, the other thing is don't put your text in all caps. And, you know, believe it or not, it's said that putting things in all caps is the equivalent of yelling at somebody. I know my kids would probably love it if I sent them an email whenever I got mad at them and just wrote it in all caps instead of raising my voice and, you know, hollering at them like I do sometimes when they push me to the edge. So, you know, make sure that you're not using all caps. You know, if you have typing challenges, take the extra time and do the capitals the way they need to be done on the screen. Okay, so unless you are someone who has won the Scripps National Spelling Bee, like these eight um, very, very talented students here on the screen, please make sure you're double checking your spelling. So spelling is very important and grammar as well. You know, the spell check cannot be relied on to catch spelling mistakes. And, you know, I say this knowing that I am not the best at double checking what I have written before I send it out. Um, I try to do that. And, but I don't always take the time to do it. You know, in my presentations, I try to make certain that I always double check because sometimes spell check will do you a favor if you have misspelled something and change it to what it thinks you wanted it to be spelled as. But there's a very good chance that that wasn't what you were intending either. Um, you know, and I mentioned this because I had a, an email recently that I sent out you know, within this current year that I was announcing our township sign grant program and that we had converted this pre-grant meeting over to three online modules so people wouldn't have to travel in for meetings any longer. And I misspelled the word pre-grant and spell check in its infinite wisdom fixed it for me, but instead of fixing it to pre-grant, it fixed it to pregnant. So I sent an email out telling people they no longer had to come to the pregnant meetings. And I had some colleagues who did email me wanting to know about these pregnant meetings. And, you know, I apologized to them. There was no way for me to apologize to everybody on the email list server I sent this to. And I think it's even more embarrassing when I get in front of a room and I haven't checked my spelling or spell check has helped me out, quote unquote, and switched the spelling and I realize while I'm standing up there, the mistake that's on the screen. So like I said, unless you won the Scripps National Spelling Bee, please go back and double check your spelling and your grammar on your presentations. All right, the next thing I'd like to talk to you about is charts and graphs. But before I do that, I'm gonna check for questions that have come in on the, the chat pod. Um, let's see, we have one, you know, at the, one here about what if you have a presentation someone else has put together and you can't chain much. Um, they've tried to highlight certain words or letters on the screen to draw attention. And, you know, are there, um, I realize this is a, a contract idea, but are there other tricks to use um, to not have people be overwhelmed with the info? You know, it, it's tough because a lot of times you do get handed a presentation that you go have to go deliver. And I would encourage you to do what you can, like I said, from where you are with what you have. If you're able to create the presentation from the ground up, that's fantastic. But, you know, if you can't, then do the very best that you can with what you've been given. And again, this is a process. And hopefully the person who gave you that presentation will eventually see a presentation done in a different way with more of these tips and tricks utilized that, you know, they will then realize, hey, you know, I need to change the style I'm doing or using, or maybe you can even like provide them the tip sheet and say, you know, I took this webinar and, you know, well, I understand that we've got this presentation already set and ready to go for, you know, such and such a date. You know, here's some ideas for future presentations, because I'm sure by the time they've given you the presentation that you're supposed to deliver, there's no way they want to go back and update it. So, you know, you just got to do the very best you can. And then there was another question that came in. It says, how do we incorporate class activities into the webinar? For example, the, the work zone traffic control classes. And that's a, a great question. 
Um, and I'm going to talk about class and engagement of participants a little bit later on in this presentation. So hold on to that question. Oh, and somebody said I jinxed myself, get ready for my dogs to bark. Well, you know, we'll see. Hopefully they know which side the bread is buttered on and who owns the dog treats and they won't be barking too much until we get through with the presentation. Um, and somebody else has added in, they'd like to know how or when it's best to acknowledge reference or materials from publications or presentations. Um, with that, you know, what I have done is put information on the bottom of my handout as far as like referencing where I've gotten information from or, you know, information about materials that they need to visit. I incorporate that into my handout, not so much into the actual um, PowerPoint itself, because what I want as a reference guide is not my PowerPoint. What I want as a reference guide is that handout that I'm giving them. So let's see, and another question has come in real quick. What do you recommend regarding animations, slide development when presenting via web or in person? Hang on to that question. I'm going to talk to you about animations when, in a couple slides here. Um, but as far as hyperlinks, I definitely would put those on the handout versus the slide. Um, that's something that you know, I really feel needs to go into the, the reference material they're taking away. And while we're at it, I do have one more poll question for you guys. Let's see. And, you know, your answers are not being recorded, so feel free to admit it if you have done this. It says it's distributing the poll, so hopefully it'll be up in a second. And I'll tell you right off the bat, I've done it. I've put way too much information on a slide knowing immediately that even the people in the front row weren't going to be able to, you know, see the information. So, all right, the votes are coming in. Yeah, that people are saying they've done it. People are saying, no, they haven't. Good for you guys if you really haven't. Um, but I'd say the majority of the people who give presentations are definitely guilty of this. When we get over 84% that have voted, I'll go ahead and close it and share the information with you here. So keep voting. You'll help us get there quicker. I like the people who say that they're not going to admit that they did it. So, all right, I'm going to close the voting and share the results with you. So it's a pretty even split amongst those who gave yes or no. And 10%, and you guys pretty much are, are in the yes column, even though you're not going to admit it. So I, the majority of the people know that they've put things on a slide that, you know, wasn't going to be able to be read. So let's talk about too much information on the slide. You know, you want to make certain that you limit the number of objects that are on a page. And one of the numbers that has been shared is six. They say that, you know, six is an ideal number. If you look on this slide that I've pulled off the internet, uh, it's just got too much going on on it. It's at the top. The biggest thing is third quarter performance, but what are they really trying to communicate here? Because they, they've squeezed not only five different bullet points in here, but three different charts. And, you know, by the time a presenter would talk through all the information on this slide, I'm telling you that more than half your audience has gone off and they're like daydreaming about something else. So what you want to do is make sure you're sticking to that rule of less than or, you know, no more than six items on a slide. So, and with that, you also want to make sure that if you have animations, and this goes to your animation question, um, that they're not distracting animations. So, you know, I'd say limit your animations to things that are very relevant to what you're talking about and make sure there's something that's not overly distracting and that if it is going to be an animation you're using, you know, use it and then move on because I've seen presentations where, you know, it's fall and they're talking about a very technical topic, but they decided to put Mr. Turkey in the upper right hand corner of the screen where they have 15 bullet points. And I got to tell you, Mr. Turkey over and over again for the whole time that slide is up there is incredibly annoying, at least from you know the perspective of people in the audience. And it definitely detracted from whatever those 15 bullet points were because we didn't remember that. We just remembered Mr. Turkey in the corner. So, you know, 
very, very sparingly with animations. Um, there's a hierarchy of things on your screen, those six things, no more than six, as far as what's going to capture people's attention. Now, the first thing that's going to capture the attention of someone who's looking at the screen that's supposed to be complementing your presentation is a moving item. So Mr. Turkey is going to grab their attention first. The next thing that's going to grab their attention is what's called a signaling color. And being in transportation, we know what these are. It's red, yellow, and green. Those are the colors that are going to grab people's attention. So the next thing that's going to grab their attention is a high contrast. So as high contrast came onto the screen, you probably saw your eyes be drawn to that bottom left hand side because the yellow and the black definitely are a high contrast plus yellow is a signaling color. And then the last thing that is in this hierarchy is larger in size. Now, I don't know if you realized it, but back when I was talking on the other screen about the items which were, and I'm scrolling back through here, so give me a second. The, this screen here where we're talking about focus and leveraging contrast and streamlining color, as I moved back and forth between each of those bullet points, not bullet points, excuse me, keywords, the words got bigger in addition to turning red. It's just a slight you know, enlargement of the text. I want to say it was no more than two points bigger than the other items, but I made them bigger and that helped to bring forward that point to hold your attention. So I used a signaling color. I made the font size a little bit bigger there. And that's something that you can definitely use as you're building your presentations. Same with here. I don't know if you noticed it on the you know, I used a signaling color and I made the font size just slightly bigger for the item that was being um, introduced as I was talking through it. So larger in size is a great way to um, bring the information in. So next thing I'd like to talk to you about is acronyms. And I know that in the LTAP world, we're guilty of this, just like everybody else is out there in the business world. LTAP stands for Local Technical Assistance Program. And boy, if you get a group of LTAPers, as we call ourselves in a room, we can talk to you about the program all day long just using acronyms. Um, and it makes me think back to the days when people first started sending text messages. And this lady on the screen with her OMG, I was not someone who was up on what these acronyms meant. And every time I get a text message from one of my kids, because I picked up texting in order to be able to communicate with them, you know, I would have to go out and Google what this acronym meant, you know, because they were abbreviating all kinds of things on these text messages. So, you know, I want to caution you in using acronyms on your slides and in your presentation, you know, Please don't talk in acronym ease. Please make sure that you're taking it from the perspective of not everybody in your audience is going to really understand what this acronym means. I even find it within our own agency that, you know, I'll be in a meeting and they just assume because they know what an acronym means that I know what an acronym means. I remember having to leave my first meeting where they talked about T. TAM, T-A-M, and you have to go figure out what that meant, Transportation Asset Management, back when that first became a, a, a buzz acronym. So please make sure you're explaining those um, in your presentation, at least the first time you use it. So going back to our rule of six, I'd like to talk to you about charts and graphs. And with charts and graphs, even though there's six charts on here, it's still too much information. Charts and graphs really are a special category when you're presenting them on a slide. So what you want to make sure is that you're not overloading your audience with too much information so that it's distracting them. Um, you want to make sure that you're streamlining the information you're presenting. So with this chart, um, I had pulled it out and wanted to show you, and I'm not endorsing any website, but I want to show you that, you know, there can be too much information, even if you're using one chart that's provided. And, you know, consider not only the type of chart you're using, 
but the size of the font to describe the information that's being provided. You know, you want to make certain that it's easily communicatable information on the, the chart and graph and that they can understand it. You know, sometimes I think charts and graphs are a representation during a presentation of the person trying to show us all of the different charts and graphs that they know how to use. And that's not the goal. The goal is to communicate information clearly and succinctly to your audience. So I went out and looked for a chart and graph when I was building this presentation that I had never seen before in my life. And, and this is one I had never, ever seen before. And I'm sure some of you are going to email me afterward and say, oh, yeah, we've used this type of chart or graph. But, you know, this one actually has to do with swimming times and how many laps people are doing when they're swimming. When I first saw this chart, I thought for sure it was some kind of traffic diagram, you know, traffic flow or something like that. But no, it, it was all about swimming. So, you know, use charts and graphs in your presentation that the majority of the people are used to seeing and understand how to read. And don't have the charter graph have too much information in it so that it gets the people either distracted or confused or you know it, it, they just turn off because of the information that's on the screen um, i'm trying to in this chart show you some information that i think for the most part is fairly easy to read you know we've taken just one you know pie chart and put it on the screen as opposed to the six that you saw on the earlier screen and this chart actually came out of a, a report that we did and our LTAP Center about training that we offered last calendar year. And it's, you know, talking about the different percentages of um, training delivered in the different methods. Now, in this chart, say I wanted to talk about one particular section of the chart a little bit more than others. Instead of getting a laser pointer out, which that to me is a big no-no because they are just one of the the cockroaches you know right along with misuse of powerpoint of presentations you know what i like to do instead is to use what i call the call out method and there's a thing called a snipping tool that comes on most of the pcs um, who um, it should be all the pcs really that have the windows based software and i use the snipping tools to create what i call a call out so in this case I wanted to talk more on this chart about delivery of live webinars. So what I did is I took the information from the bottom right hand side of the screen. I used the snipping tool to make a snip of that information. And then I made it a little bit larger and moved it to the center screen, put some lines up to show I was, you know, that's what I made larger. So the larger size representation of that information lets people see it easier. And I put it up closer to where the color matched in the chart so that way they could see the information better. But, you know, there are a ton of charts and graphs that we had in that report. Um, but I would definitely not try to put them all on one screen. If I was going to talk about them, I would try to break them out chart by chart or, you know, topic by topic and talk about them and use that call out method. So people learn by doing. And this is going to go back to the point someone was asking earlier about how do we get people engaged when we're doing, you know, e-learning or we're delivering a webinar. And it is much more challenging when you're doing it virtually. You know, today I tried to use polls with you. Um, but, you know, the best way for people to learn is by doing. And if you can, you need to find some way to let them get up and actually practice it. You know, in an ideal world, if we were doing this type of presentation, you know, I could think of different ways that we could maybe follow up with, you know, mentored peer groups and people working to build presentations that they felt were incorporating these techniques. And then maybe we could have different times that people would work together to share those presentations and tips and ways they're applying them. Um, you know, our one hour webinar this morning doesn't lend itself to that type of interaction, but that's a way that we could definitely have people take what they're learning and actually apply it. Um, one of the things that I've tried to do to keep people engaged is I've tried to use um, interactive 
exercises like the polls you saw this morning. And this is a, a chart from an interactive activity I did with a, a transportation research board, a, a TRB um, group that I work with. And we were having a conference call virtually and talking about different things um, related to our committee. And one of the things we were discussing is what did we feel when we got the opportunity to actually be together were the most useful components of our meeting. We had 17 people on the call and I used a, a platform called Mentimeter. I'm not endorsing them. It's just something that we had available. And through Mentimeter, we had a poll set up and those 17 individuals were able to use their smartphones to vote and we were able to keep them engaged in the conversation to you know have information then about what we felt what they felt was the most important components of our annual meeting so you know keeping people involved and if you can find a way to allow them to apply what it is that you're teaching, you know, during that time is fantastic. But, you know, at least give them ideas about how to do it once you're done with the presentation, because to learn, students really do need to do something. They need to do something with that information. So one of my last slides here I want to share with you, and we are coming up on that hour time frame, so I want to be respective of your time, is this metamorphosis slide. You know, we're all kind of on the left. We're starting out as the caterpillar. And we want to get to the right hand side to be the butterfly because we know that's the transformation that we would like to make with our PowerPoint presentations. But I'll encourage you to understand that it's a process and it takes time. You know, pick one thing that you've learned from the webinar this morning and decide that that's what you're going to work on first and then pick another thing and eventually you'll get to where you want to be you know eventually you'll be that person that when they walk away from the conference they're like boy that person is an excellent presenter and I want to make presentations the way they do because I took so much away from that and I learned and I stayed engaged the whole time and I feel inspired and I know that each of you have it in you to make this metamorphosis with the information that you've learned this morning and maybe even go on to research some more. I've put additional links on the bottom of the handout that I'm going to send you. Um, if you want to go out and watch some um, other talks by people who have tried to make the same uh, metamorphosis. So feel free to, you know, share that information with others and you know work through your own process and right now if you have a little time as you're working and telecommuting it might be a good opportunity to pull up your presentations that you know you're going to have later this year when we all get back to the craziness that life can be when we're you know not telecommuting and we're running 50 different directions at once and work on your presentations and see what you can do to work these tips in but I know that each of you can definitely do it. It just takes some time. So with that, I'm giving you my contact information and I'm happy to talk to anyone you know, offline about any questions you might have. I'm gonna open up the um, chat or the question box again to see. Um, oh, someone's correcting me. Apparently that crazy chart with the horizontal lines was actually Formula One racing. Well, I apologize because I thought it was swimming. See, that just goes to prove how confusing that chart was. Um, oh, there's more than one of you who have told me that was Formula One racing. So yeah, I mean, that just goes to show how confusing that chart. So um, another person is asking about the use of borders, headers, and footers on slide. You know, if I can get away without the borders, headers, and footers, I don't use them. And I definitely don't use numbers on the slides because I don't want people sitting there thinking, okay, we're on slide 7 of 43. Oh my goodness, how much longer is this going to take? Um, I try to make it more of a, a delivery of things that help to enhance the presentation and that I'm making. And I, if you can get away without those borders, headers, and footers, I think sometimes that's the best. Um, you know, the, the small font comment, I know it's hard. If somebody else is doing the presentation for you and they, um, 
you know, are making that font that small. Again, if you have to go with it, go with it, but maybe you can kind of like suggest or, or slide information their way that will suggest that it needs to be larger. Um, and some people said they've been taught never to use red font um, in a slide. So, I mean, if something that you really are not comfortable with, don't do it. But, you know, I saw, you know, at least today with what I was delivering that, I felt there were some opportunities to incorporate it, and I used that. And again, it's the um, signaling colors that the um, I built in there, those signaling colors that help to draw people's eyes. So there was a question on pictures that you use from the internet and citing them. I do try to cite them, um, but what I first try to do more than anything is to look for images that have a Creative Commons license. And there is a way that you can set it to do a search just for images that have Creative Commons license. And I would encourage you if you're using Google to go into Google Images and look up how to do that because Creative Commons allows you to use the images so long as you give attribution. Um, another thing that um, I always look at as well is, you know, especially public agencies, the public agencies, you know, were funded with public money, you know, Federal Highway especially, and, and if they have an image out there, it's public money that's funded that creation of that image, and then I don't really have any issue with using it in my presentation then, because I'm also a public agency, and I'm not used, looking to make any money off the presentation I'm giving, so. All right, I know we're getting to the end here, guys, and I want to be respectful of your time. So if there's anybody's questions I have um, not gotten to, I will be happy to respond to you offline. And if you want to contact me, you're more than welcome to contact me. Um, my contact information is up on the screen there, um, both my email and my phone number. I'd be happy to talk to you about the presentation today, but I'm really hopeful that you found good information here for you and that you're able to apply this in your work. And everybody, please, please, please stay safe out there. Have a good rest of your day. Take care.